He leadeth me. Oh, bless for thought. Oh, words with heavenly comfort from whatever I do, where I be, still tis God's hand that leadeth me. Sometimes mid scenes of deepest gloom, sometimes where it ends, bows bloom, by water still, oh trouble be, still tis God's hand that leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me by his own hand. He leadeth me, his faithful follower I will be. For by God's hand, he leadeth me. And when my task on earth is done when by God's grace the victory's won even death go away I will not be since God through Jordan leadeth he leadeth me, he leadeth me by his own hand. My God leadeth me, his faithful follower I would be for by his hand. And it seemed it just won't come. Doors are shut. Things are rough. It seems that you are done. The devil is a liar and a deceiver too. But God is not through blessing you. You've been waiting on deliverance and it seems it just won't come. God is sick, pain everywhere. It seems nobody cares But the devil He's a liar And a deceiver too But God Is not through Blessing you I'm 
going to sing that again. Because the devil needs to hear. You've been waiting on deliverance. And it seems it just won't come. I said, your body's sick. There's pain everywhere. It seems nobody cares. But the devil, he's a liar and a deceiver too. But God is not through blessing you. God is not through blessing you. God, he's not through blessing you. So whatever he has promised, my God is faithful to do. Cause God is not through God is not through my 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 God is not through I said my God is not through makes no difference what you're going through God is not through no matter how bad your days are, God is not through. My God, He's not through. I know I'm speaking to somebody. God is not through. I'm telling you, God is not through. Bless. Sing you God is not through. You ought to feel like shouting right now. Because God is not through blessing us. What is so amazing to me is that in spite of how we treat him, he still blesses us. He still makes a way for us. God is not through blessing us. I want to take a few moments and share with you a thought that I've entitled, Who's That in the Mirror? Who's That in the Mirror? Shall we pray? Father God, we know that there is a war going on right now. The devil is trying to distract your children. He wants their hearts to be encapsulated with darkness, with disappointment and despair. But we know that you are King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And so I'm asking today that the sun may shine down in every one of our hearts that we may be hungry and thirsty for your words today. Shower us, God, until we want no more. In Jesus' name, amen. Who's that in the mirror? Have you ever gone to your mirror and you went to check your face and and while you're there looking or you're about to wash your face or something, but while you're there looking, all of a sudden, you're looking in the mirror and you're looking in your eyes and 
all of a sudden there's a transformation where you are now looking deeper into your soul. You see your reflection, but you're looking inside your soul. You're, you're there thinking and pondering and, and you're going deep, deep, deeper, yet deeper into your soul. That is what I'm praying will happen to us this afternoon by the power of the Holy Spirit. We're going to talk about a man who had to do the same thing by the Spirit of God that we will have to do. If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Luke chapter 22. and We will read verses 31 and 32. Luke chapter 22 verses 31 and 32. Luke chapter 22 verses 31. Through 32, if you have it, say amen. amen. All right. If you don't have it, say not yet. All right. Luke chapter 22, 31 and 32. And the Bible says this. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan had desire to what everybody? To what everybody? Uh, uh, that's not everybody. I know we got more than just two or three people. I hear two or three here. But I need you to go with me. God has a word for you today. Not me, but God has a word for you today. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath what? Desire to do what? He wants you. Make no mistake. The devil wants you. He'll do what he needs to do to get you. That he may sift you as wheat. That means that God wants to separate you. The devil wants to separate you from God. He wants to have control of you. And verse 32 says, but I have prayed for thee. That thy faith does what, everybody? And when thou art what? Strengthen thy brethren. The first time I read this, I had to go back and read it again because I was asking, what could Jesus mean when he stated to Peter, and when thou art converted? Strengthen thy brother. Are you saying, Jesus, that Peter... Is not converted. You can't be talking about this Peter who asked if he could walk on water and you told him come on and he began to walk on water. You can't be talking about this Peter when you ask the question who am I and Peter says thou art the Christ thou art the son of the living God. You can't be talking about the Peter who, when you instructed your disciples to go out and take nothing with them, that they went out with nothing, but they all came back rejoicing because they proclaimed that God had made a way. You can't be talking about the Peter who was a part of the inner circle with James and John. You cannot be talking about Peter saying that he's not converted. But the Bible proclaims that he is talking about that same Peter who after three and a half years of being with Jesus day in and day out, Jesus is saying to Peter, you're not converted. And furthermore, Satan is trying to sift you as wheat. The word converted means to bring over from one belief, from one view, to bring about a religious conversion. It, it caused me pause for Peter who has done all of these deeds in the name of Jesus Christ. For Jesus to say to him, 
you are not converted. I'm sure that if I had met Peter on the street, I'm sure that if I had heard him preach in the church, that I would have said, there is a converted man. But Jesus, who looks not on the outward, but looks at the heart, said to Peter, you ain't ready. It makes me then question my own relationship. Many times we love to flaunt our pedigrees. We love to talk about the things that we have done in the house of God. We love to tell folk that we are children of the most high God. But can God look at us today and say, you know what? You're not converted. Jesus is saying to Peter that with all that experience that you've had with me, you still have the same mindset that you started out with. He says, you have two flaws, Peter. One is that you don't know and understand who you are. And you don't really know who I am. Peter needed to be converted. Brought over to a different mindset that the one, than the one he presently has. With all that he has done, with all that he has seen, his mind was still not right. The Bible tells us that this warfare that we're in with the devil is not physical, it's not fleshly. The Bible says there is a war for our mind. Because if I can get your mind, I got your body. That's why when we're courting, when we're trying to date, that, that we go after a person's mind. We do things physically, but we're trying to get their mind. And when a woman or a man says, you know what? I couldn't stop thinking about you. Then you know that you're in there. And the devil uses the same tactics to get control of us. You can come here sitting in the pews. You can participate in the program. And yet your mind is way off somewhere else. Jesus is saying, you're not converted. Why is this thing of being converted so important for Peter and for us? Why is conversion so important? I need you to turn with me in your Bibles. Romans chapter 8. Look at verse 5 through 8. Romans chapter 8 verses 5 through 8. This is going to give us an understanding of why we must be converted. Peter being there with the Savior, walking and talking with him, performing miracles, doing all of these things that shows that he is a disciple of God. But God says to him, you are not converted. Romans chapter 5, Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 8. If you have it, say amen. amen. The Bible says, for they that are after the what? Come on, talk to me, everybody. Come on, talk to me. I'm not going to be long. They that are after the what? Do mind the what? But they that are after the spirit, the what? For to be carnally minded is what, everybody? But to be spiritually minded is what? And here's the crux of it, verse 7 and verse 8. Because the carnal mind is enmity, what? If you got the world on your mind, if you got yourself on your mind, you are an enemy of God. Now let me tell you something. This, this is a hard perplexing position for all of us to be in. We are born in sin, shaping in iniquity. We are taught to look out for ourselves. That's what we do. We look out for me. I'm going to look out for me first. That's what we're taught. 
But the Bible tells us that Peter, when Jesus was saying to him, you are not converted, Jesus was saying to Peter, you still looking out for yourself. That's why the disciples had that big contention, that big argument, because James and John messed around and had their mama ask, can they sit on the right and left? Oh, so, so, that's what y'all doing, y'all. You, you're looking out for yourself. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can be. You need to get that. You got a mind that looks out for you. You got a mind that's, that puts you first and what you like, you like. What you don't like, you don't like. What you don't want to hear preach, you don't want to hear. What you don't want to do, you don't do. The Bible says that mind can't honor God, can't respect God. I heard someone say one time, and, and I thought it was kind of hard because they say, you know what? If you don't have a mind to serve God, you don't need to come to church. But in some respects, it makes sense because you're just wasting your time. Here's what Paul is saying, verse 8. He says, so then they that are in the flesh cannot. Who's that, who, who, who's that in the mirror? Who, who, who are we looking at? If you're in the flesh, Paul says, you cannot please God. We have to be converted. Let's put up the first slide. This is what the spirit of prophecy says about Peter and what his mindset was. For this work, Peter's own experience of sin and suffering and repentance had prepared him. It's talking about the work when God had come to him and said, uh, Peter, do you love me? And Peter said, you know I love you, Lord. He said, feed my sheep. But here, listen. Not until he had learned his weakness could he know the believer's need of dependence on who? Christ. On Christ. Amid the storm of temptation, he had come to understand that man can walk safely only as in utter self-distrust he relies upon the Savior. It doesn't seem to make sense that you telling me, God, this is me. I have feelings. I have thoughts. I have plans. This is me. But you're telling me I can't trust me? This is harder than it sounds. For you to say, kill me, God. Because for me to be saved, for me to live forever, for me to enjoy the mansions, and, and for me to not worry about death or suffering, pain anymore, I must die. Many today stand where Peter stood. When in self-confidence, he declared that he would not deny his Lord. And because of their self-sufficiency, they fall an easy prey to Satan's devices. Anytime we think we can handle it, the devil loves it. He knows he can overcome us. He knows that he's ultimately going to win against us. Anytime we depend on who we are. Doesn't matter what your resume say. I don't mind telling you as a pastor of 40 years, I was nowhere near. I was nowhere near conversion. 
I was walking on my own laurels. Oh, yeah, yeah, I've been to school. Oh, the great school, Oakwood College. And Elder Johnson, you know, he talks about, I've been to school. I've pastored here. I've I done this. And the devil added money. He added houses. He added businesses. And I was standing there unconverted. Because if you had asked me, are you willing to give all this stuff up? I would have said, not yet. And the devil comes and he tempts us. He offers us a life that he believes that we want because of our own nature. And Jesus is saying, you're not converted. You see, you don't want to be on your deathbed before you get conversion. And there are many who find themselves in that predicament. I have gone to houses that make uh, uh, the Taj Mahal look small. And when I go in, the reason I'm there is because they have been declared to be seeing death face to face. And when I go in, I look around and I see all of the fineries and and, and I say, oh, you have a beautiful house, but they don't care nothing about no house. They are at the place where, where they are willing now that if God would just show up, they're at the place where they now are willing to listen to his voice, to accept his plan, his leading. But I'm saying to you, like Peter, Jesus is saying, you are not converted. We still, we still believe. We still believe that we know best. What did Peter have to do to be converted? To understand. The first thing that Peter was converted to was that being in the house doesn't mean that you're a part of the family. Peter talked all about his laurels and, and how he was one of the big three. But he found out that being in the house doesn't mean you're part of the family. And that's why you hear me at different occasions say to you that you can come to church all you want to. The devil will drive you. He'll show for you to church. He don't care nothing about that. Because you're coming to church does not induce the fact that you are converted or will be converted. I've said in church, like I told you, I said in church, sing in the choir. My grandmama and all the ladies on the front row just falling out. And I'm up there singing, thinking about what I'm going to do before I go to AY. Unconverted. Thinking about that, that I'm going to go down to the pool room and try to win me some money. But I'm standing up there singing. Like I love God. But being in the house doesn't mean that you're part of the family because it is God who will say, I know you, enter in, or I never knew you. Here's what the Bible says in Matthew 22, 14. For many are called, but few are chosen. Many. That means all of us. You can come in. You can take a seat. You can sing the songs. You can pray. But only a few are chosen. Let's go to the next slide. 
Listen to what it says. Many are called, but few are chosen. Many hear the invitation of mercy, are tested and proved. But few are sealed with the seal of the living God. Few will humble themselves as a little child that they may enter the kingdom of heaven. You can't go to heaven big and bold the way you want to go. Well, I, I really was saying that to me because I found that out. You can't, you can't go to heaven like you want to go. It says, few receive the grace of Christ with self-abasement, with a deep and permanent sense of their unworthiness. You all need the converting power of God. You need to seek him for yourselves. For your soul's sake, neglect this work no longer. It is time. You know, we were talking in Sabbath school about that, that when calamity starts to really happen, when the Sunday blue law comes into place, all folk are going to be coming to church and they're going to be trying to get saved. Let me tell you something. They're not going to do that. They're not going to do that. We, we buy that, that, oh yeah, we're going to come to church and that's when we're going to get right with the Lord. No, no, no. Who you are becoming, you will be. Who you are becoming, you will be. That's why the devil is trying to keep us so distracted. It says all your troubles grow out of your separation from God. You don't have no troubles. You don't have no troubles when you with God. You ain't got no food on the table. You know he'll give you food. Let, let, let me tell you something. See, y'all might not believe this, but this is how God works. I went to a dinner one time, and there were about 30 people there. And we went to dinner, and they only had about four or five dishes on the table. I said, how 30 people going to eat from there? And then I decided to pray. I said, Lord, I may not get no food out of here, so you keep me from being hungry. Do you know I wasn't hungry? Do you know that God... Fi- See, y'all... Okay. When you, when you are with God, he'll do stuff that you can't even think about. He'll keep you. He'll provide for you. All of our troubles, Mrs. White says, grow out of our separation from God. Your disunion, your dissension are the fruit of your unchristian character. And here's the part that blew me away. She said, I had thought to remain silent and let you go on until you should see and abhor the sinfulness of your course. But backsliding from God produces hardness of heart. Somebody asked the question, how could Pharaoh after all the plagues still say that he wasn't going to let God's people go. But the Bible says that his heart was hardened. And I'm telling you, it is a dangerous place to be separated from God that you put in your mind, I got a plan. I'm going to do what I want to do for 30, 40 years and then I'm going to come to God. But your separation from God hardens your heart. It hardens your heart. Zechariah 4, 6 says this. Then he answered and spake unto me saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by, but by my spirit, said the Lord. God is saying, that it is his spirit that leads and guides us and affords salvation to be ours. Secondly, what Peter had to be converted to was that the way of doing things, his way of doing things are not God's way. God says in Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, said the Lord. 
For as the heaven are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours. And my thoughts than your thoughts. This is the most serious part right here of this message. It's hard to argue with yourself. It is most difficult for you to conquer yourself when self is telling you, do this, do that, buy this, go there. It is hard. The Bible says that if you are looking to go to heaven, you can't trust yourself. You can't listen to yourself. And I'm telling you, it, self comes up so quick, yes. just like this. Somebody can say the wrong thing, and you have just got off your knees praying. Self steps right up, pushes that prayer to the side, and say, let me tell you something. Amen. We have come to a place, and, and I've talked to... Uh, the elders and other folk about where we are. And I'm talking about the church as a whole. We've come to a place where anything goes in the house of God. I, I don't expect not, not too many amens on this. We've come to a place where anything goes in the house of God. We've gotten to a place where some of you and, and it was true for me. Some of us are doing stuff that if our grandmothers or great grandmothers were still alive, they would smack us in the face and say, how dare you do what you're doing in the house of God? How dare you talk like you're talking? It's the truth anyway. You don't have to say it, man. I know it's the truth. I know it's the truth. But we have gotten to a place where what we desire, what self, what our thinking is. Well, I, I don't think nothing wrong with it. We've gotten to a place where God is not the head. Ah. He's not the head anymore. Have you ever thought about Sodom and Gomorrah? Yes. You, you do know Sodom and Gomorrah didn't start out the way they ended up. Yes. Lot wouldn't have gone over there if they had been at the level of degradation so much so where the angels were sent by God to destroy the city. They didn't start out that way. But they ended up because they were following their own thinking. Let me tell you something. Oh, man, we on camera too. Okay. I told you before. I've been some places. I've done some things. As a pastor in the Seventh-day Adventist church. That I never thought I would do. I didn't start out to do it. But when you're following yourself. You see, uh, you can talk to an alcoholic. I, I, I've talked to some friends who are drug addicts. And when you talk to them, uh, you, you say, is, is this what you plan to do? To hope? I didn't plan to do this. But I was following what I wanted. I wanted to hang out with friends. I, 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 I wanted to go places and have fun. I told some young people a couple months ago, I said, uh, one young lady said to me, I, I want to have fun. Uh, I'm, I'm 19. I just want to have fun. I said, you got to be careful of that fun because the devil got a K in his back pocket. So that while you out there having fun, you don't see him add that K. 
and it becomes funk. And you know how many years it takes you to get the funk off you? Some of it, some of it is still on me. And I have to pray every day, God, don't let the funk fill my nostrils. Don't let me smell like sin. We have to be converted. And finally, Peter found out that surrender brings salvation. Peter was walking around for those three and a half years high on the hog. He was one that everybody listened to. But Jesus says, you know what, Peter? You're going to deny me three times. Spirit of prophecy said Peter looked and literally did like this. <laughs> Lord, you don't know what you talk. But when he was standing there and the young girl said, uh, sir, aren't you, don't you belong to Solomon's porch? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, no, no. I, 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 yeah, I, I was there visiting. I, I don't go there. Three times. And she said that the third time, to make sure that he was not affiliated, associated in their minds, he began to curse. What the blanket and blank that I say to you? I told you I'm not a member over there. And she said, all of a sudden, Peter turned, looked in the face of Jesus. But in Jesus' face, he didn't see contentment. He didn't see anger. He saw compassion. And the Bible says that Peter's heart was broken. He found himself running out, crying, tears flowing. He wasn't sad because of what he had said he wouldn't do. He was sad because he did it. To the one who had loved him. He did it. To the one who says I'm going to prepare a place for you. He did it. To the one who was bleeding. Had been whipped. With cat of nine's tail. Who has been spit in the face. He saw Jesus there with them taking their hands and slapping him in the face. And putting the robe of purple on him and putting the crown on his head. And taking a rod and beating him on the head. Peter saw that. The story says he runs, he runs, he runs. He's crying profusely. He runs and he ends up. In the Garden of Gethsemane. This is why he says. He wanted to die. He would have followed. In Judas' steps. But he remembered. The words that Jesus had said. He said, Peter, the devil desires to have you, but I pray for you. Ah, somebody should have shouted right there. Jesus said, I know that you're going to go through these trials and tribulations. I know that it's going to be hard in your heart. It's going to be filled with pain. I know that there are times you're going to want to give up. But I pray for you, Peter. 
She said that the presence of the Holy Spirit was there with Peter and bringing to his mind the words of Jesus that I love you, Peter. I love you no matter what. Just surrender. The Bible says that Peter there in the Garden of Gethsemane repented. He understood now that he couldn't lean to his own understanding. But in all his ways, he had to acknowledge that God is God. And if I'm going to be saved, I have to lean on the everlasting arm. Who do you, who, 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 who do you see right now when you look in the mirror? Who, 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 who do you see? Do you see somebody who has said all to Jesus? I surrender. Do you see somebody who's still trying to amass, according to this world, greatness, living a great life? Who do you see? Who do you want to see? Let me tell you something. I've come to the point, it don't matter. It doesn't matter. All the years that I failed God, I failed Him. Some folk would say, oh, oh, you did great things. Oh, you did this, you did that. I failed God. I failed him because I wasn't converted. He says all of our righteousness is as filthy rags. So where accolades would come and, and there are those even now who say, oh, oh, oh Pastor Matthew, you did all oh, I failed God because I looked in the mirror and I saw who I was. I looked deep down heard Jesus say you're not converted but I want you to know like I told you before God is a God who will let you start over <laughs> God allowed me to start over I told you I was I was preaching a crusade. I was preaching a crusade and 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 and, and, and I had 34 people who took their stand to be baptized. God said to me, hold it, it's not 34, it's 35. I said, who the 35th one? You I'm preaching the crusade, but as the 35th person came in the pool, it was me who started over, got baptized again. All God wants to do is save us. But we gotta, we gotta be converted. We gotta surrender. We got to understand that being in the house don't mean you're part of the family. We got to understand that, that, that his thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways. God will get you. The devil may try to send you down the path of darkness. And he may be able to do that. But your end is going to be in the kingdom. Let me tell you something. Time out. Time out for playing. Time out for putting on a facade. I'm telling you, I am in the last two and a half years, I am better than I've ever been. Because see, some of you, if I told you the story, 
You say, well, you don't have that? You don't have that? Oh, you going through that? You don't have this? I said, yeah, you right. They said, well, that's a bad existence. I said, no, the one thing I got is Jesus. The one thing I got is Jesus. And I'm telling you, you, you don't know how I wish I could put in you what God has put in me. Because what's happening right now is the devil has your mind a little distorted. He has it confused. He have you thinking, you, you feel the presence of the spirit saying to you, hey, he's right. He's right. You need to give your heart to God. But then all of a sudden the devil is bombarding your mind right now. Oh, wait. You don't need to do that. Hold it. You got plans. Uh, you don't know if God going to do what he, uh, what you want him to do. You don't know if he's going to do it the way you want. I'm telling you that if you do it God's way, you're not going to have joy one day. You're going to have joy every day. Every day. I told you, I told you, I, I, I'm, I'm getting ready to close, but, but I'm telling you, he, I try to give you practical analogy. I told you about the lady, we went to a house when I was at Oakwood, me, Morell, and another preacher went to the lady's house. We were doing an uh, extern program out in the community. We went to a house, she said, oh, come on to my house, come on to my house. I got dinner. I'm going to have dinner for y'all. So we go over there. She's an older lady. we like, man, we're going to have collard greens. We're going to have a uh, potato salad. Probably going to have some fried chicken or some chickens. We're going to have cornbread. we listing all this stuff while we're riding in the car. Man, it's going to be a good meal. She went in the kitchen. I told some of you this before. She was in there, came out. We ain't hear no pots rustling or nothing. But she came out with this silver platter. And on the silver platter, she had a crystal clear pitcher of milk and a big, tall family box of cornflakes. And at first, we looking like... But that woman... I'm, I'm talking about conversion now. The woman walked holding that silver platter with that milk like she was carrying 14 karat gold and she set it down in front of us and she said all right y'all ready to pray y'all ready and she said god thank you for what we're about to receive thank you for the gift i'm telling you as God is my witness that the spirit of God came on all of us and we began to see these cornflakes like they were potato salad and collard greens and cornbread and we sat there and we ate those cornflakes saying hallelujah in the name of Jesus Christ looking at this woman because God had converted our hearts I'm telling you what he can do. See, when we come, when we come to places like this, when we come to times like this, this is the most crucial time of the service where you make a decision. I'm going to serve him. No matter what, I'm going to serve him. This is a crucial time. You come to the house of God to hear the testimony, to rub shoulders in fellowship with other believers who are telling you that God is an amazing God. No matter what you're going through, uh, Brother Honoré, no matter what you're going through, God is still an amazing God. So the question is, here's the question. Are you ready to be converted? To say, you know what, God? Even before the preacher said it, I knew I wasn't converted. I'm still in charge of me. But I hear now that you are my Savior. 
You're my bridge over troubled waters. You are the giver, the sustainer of life. And God, my prayer is to be converted today. My prayer is to serve you, to surrender all to you. I want to be able to sing a change has come over me. A change has come over me. And so the question is, are you ready to be converted? If you're ready, you can come join me. I don't care what people think. That's why I told you. That's why I'm on camera. It's recorded. Don't care. Don't care. God, I'm here to be converted. I want to be saved. I want to be used. I want to be blessed. I want my family to know that you are God and God alone. I'm here. I'm here, God. I'm here. I'm here. You want a change to come over you? Ah, hallelujah. I'm so glad it changed me. Change. Oh. 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 Come on. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. Oh, wonderful. Come on now. This is about conversion. Come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, come on, push your way up. All right, before, before we sing anymore, let me tell you something. I need to get up here where you can see me. There are, there are some people who are on the verge of dying, and you call them mother father sisters brothers children they're on the verge of eternal damnation because you're not converted you see it's one thing for us to be one way at church at the house but it's another thing how we are with them and I'm saying to you right now some of them will point to you and say you know what if you had shown me Jesus if you had shown me Jesus I could have been saved I'll be the first to tell you May 10 thousand mistakes and all I ask God to do is to give me opportunity to make it right that's all I'm asking to give me opportunity to make it right because it's not just about me being saved it's about my family it's about my family it's about my family it's about my friends come on up here baby come on up here come through push through push through Y'all push through. Sister Lorna, y'all push through. Come on in. Come on in. You are here, Solomon's porch, for a reason. You're here for a reason. Let me 
me say to you and I'm closing and I'm closing let me say to you please please I'm telling you I'm telling you you see we still gonna have dark days we still gonna have issues but what you're doing now when you say God convert my heart what happens is that it doesn't seem the same it doesn't look the same it doesn't feel the same because God will send his angels he'll send the Holy Ghost to you to say it's all right and he'll bring you through it he'll bring you through it I promise you and it's, and it's so simple all you got to do is say, God, change me. Change me. And I promise you, he's faithful to doing that. The devil will come and say to you, hey, but you're catching all kind of hell. You, it seems like you're doing worse. You say, but the change is not finished. He's changing me right now. He's changing me. I saw Elder Mike. I want you to come pray, sir. I want you to come. I want you to come. I'm asking if there's anybody else. You know better than me. I don't know. I'm not going to judge you. But if you know that conversion is still needed in your life. From whatever. Come on before Elder gets here. Because God is your God and he's willing to save you this is the time, this is the place I see some young men back there yeah, yeah yeah I told all three of y'all God got a plan for your life and if you let him take control I promise you I promise you you'll be like wow all the time come on elder Our gracious and loving Father, we thank you. We thank you so much, dear God. We thank you for the work that your Spirit is doing in us. The thought that we could walk with Jesus, talk with Jesus, have experiences with Jesus every day and still not be converted. But some of us get up on our spiritual high horses and it's so easy for the devil to knock us off those horses. We think we know. And that's why, dear God, it's so important to to humble ourselves under your mighty hand and let you have your way in our hearts. Lord, we thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you, dear God, for his constant work in our hearts as he cleans us up, straightens us out, dear God, and helps us to look in the mirror and see ourselves for who we really are. <clears throat> Lord, we just pray that every one of us will be saved when Jesus comes again. We pray for our children, Father. Lord, sometimes all we can do is pray for them. We can't live their lives. We can't live their lives. I was blessed to have praying mama, praying daddy, praying grandmamas. God bless the child who doesn't have anybody who's praying for them. 
Nobody who cares whether they are saved or lost. Lord, let that not be the case with the children of Solomon's porch. Father, we know that you love us. We know it. And if the devil raises any, any hint of doubt, we just pray, dear God, that, that we will come to know that the devil is a liar and there is no truth in him. You love us. You love us enough to give your only begotten son, Jesus. And he was willing to go to the cross to die. That same Peter, same Peter that he was praying for, ran from his side. One glance, and Peter realized that he was lost. But that same Jesus, when he got up out the tomb, one of the first names he called was Peter. See, Lord, we know Jesus doesn't hold anything against us. <laughs> I, I don't care how, how, how much disappointment Jesus doesn't hold it against us. And we just thank you for Jesus. He's sending those, those subliminal coded messages to every heart right now. <laughs> Tell my disciples and Robert <laughs> and Claude and Vinnie and George, <laughs> whomever it might be, Jesus knows who we are. He knows what it takes to save us. So dear God, we humble ourselves under his hand. There's some young folk, young families, they got a ways to go and the devil's going to do everything he can to destroy them. We pray to God that you'll strengthen them. Strengthen them, dear God. Strengthen them. Bind their hearts together. Mamas and daddies, dear God, bind them together in love so that they will be a strong fortress for their children and their children's children. They'll be able to look back and say, my mama and my daddy prayed for me. They led me to Jesus. But I know they want me to be saved. And Lord, we just thank you for Pastor Matthews. And the way he has stretched out on the altar today. We pray, dear God, that you will continue to bless his heart, bless his life, and bless him to be a blessing, dear God. We just thank you, Father, for the way your spirit is being poured out into the Solomon's Porch Fellowship through him. We pray, Father, in the precious name of Jesus, that he and his family, his children and his children's children, will be saved when Jesus comes again. And now, dear God, as we close this prayer, we, 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 we just pray, dear God, that your spirit will continue to be with us, that you will be uh, with us wherever we go not just for the rest of the day, but throughout the week, dear God. Lord, feel free to continue to have church in our hearts. And bless us, dear God, as we go from moment to moment, from day to day, from task to task, to know that we are in constant communion and fellowship with the great God of heaven. We ask it in your precious name. Amen. Oh, over me, a wonderful change has come over me. Oh, he changed, changed my life completely, and now I see. 
I sit at his feet to do what must be done. I work and work until he's done.